All right, welcome to the Sunday morning service at Liberty Baptist Church. If you can, let's stand. We're going to sing, Oh, Beautiful, Perspacious Guy, or America the Beautiful. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountain majesties above the fruit and plain. America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. Oh, beautiful, oh, pilgrim feet who stood in passion stress, a thoroughfare for freedom be across the wilderness. America, America, God mend thy every flaw. Confirm thy soul in self-control, thy liberty in law. O beautiful, for heroes prove in liberating strife, who more than self their country love, and mercy more than life. America, America, may God thy gold refine, till all success be nobleness and every gain divine. Glad you made it here for this 4th of July weekend. The Bible says in John chapter 8, verse 36, If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. If you know anything about our original writings, what it said is we have certain unalienable rights. So again, that's something no one has any say-so about. And again, uh, you ought to look that up sometime. You'll see that we have a lot of rights. It doesn't matter your skin color. It doesn't matter your financial position. It doesn't matter how tall or short or handsome or ugly you are. And for some of us that are, not, that are short and ugly, that is a, v a very good thing. Uh, but uh, again, we have those rights because God gave them to us. No one else gave them to us. But we've had, we've had men and women who have fought that we can continue to keep those rights uh, for the last several years. Uh, some of you remember um, when we used to celebrate uh, and all the teachers and students in our, our public schools sang songs like that. Uh, I learned that song at, at school. Now, I can, I can guarantee, and I haven't been in a public school in a long, long time, but I can guarantee you that most kids don't know any, they don't sing any patriotic songs because that says something about God. And of course, God's not allowed in school, uh, so it probably isn't taught. And again, our heritage also is taught as a bad thing, not a good thing. Uh, but again, you and I are so lucky that we live in the country we live in. It is not perfect by any means, but it's still, uh, I believe, the greatest, greatest place and the greatest country and greatest opportunities and privileges that anyone can. That's why people are dying to get here. Uh, again, I mean, there's folks that, that will, again, can you imagine? Uh, I drive my pickup, uh, and they don't have air conditioning. I roll the windows down, and on hot days, I hate it. There's folks that try to get here on, in the back of semis right. and in the back of vans, I mean, and stuff where there's no air conditioning, and in some cases, even no water, uh, and don't get to choose when to stop and go to the bathroom and get a drink. Uh, but you say, why are they trying to get here? Because this is a great place. And so you and I ought to, we ought to, if, we know, if you know a veteran, uh, and we have several of them here in the church, if you have a relative that's in the military now, you ought to always thank them for yeah. the, the, the fact that you and I have this freedom, and it's fought for on a regular basis. There are a lot of folks who have tried to take our freedom away through the years, and thankfully the American spirit is a very strong and a, and a tough spirit, and it doesn't give in very easily. So again, uh, appreciate having you today. Let's pray. Father, we ask as we always do, Lord, that you'd bless and meet with us this morning. I ask you, Lord, that you might... Give me your powers, I preach in the preacher's absence this morning. I ask the Lord that you be with the rest of singing, and Lord, the, the, the uh, uh, special that Brother Taylor will be bringing to us, and I pray, Lord, you'd help all of our folks that are visiting with us, especially those who this is their first time. I pray, Lord, you'd help it to be a blessing to them. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. All right, my country, tis of thee.
My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside, let freedom ring. My native country, the land of the noble free, thy name I love. I love thy rocks and rills, thy woods and temple hills. My heart with rapture thrills like that above. Our fathers, God, to thee, author of liberty, to thee we sing. Long may our land be bright with freedom's holy light. Protect us by thy might, great God our King. Always a privilege to have folks visit with us. If you're here for the first time or the first time in a long time, if you can slip your hand up for a second. Caleb, that doesn't apply to you, but we appreciate it. Good to see Caleb here today. Got some folks over here on the back row, Brother Hauser. Anyone else? Don't want to miss anyone? Anyone else? Good to see Sophia back. She got saved last Sunday, and that was a real blessing. Uh, they were dealing with her on the front row, and that's, it was the, I sent some folks down and said, go down and say hi to Sophia. And, but the, the folks in the front row that were dealing with her, they're long-winded, and they just kept talking, and I'm just joking. They were, they were dealing with her about salvation, and then after salvation, hey, some other stuff. So, life. I know. <laughs> but uh, we are glad that Sophia's back today. She got saved last Sunday, and it's always a blessing. Now, there are a lot of folks who get saved, and then they forget. They forget where they learned the truth at. I, told, I, tell, I tell people this when I'm out sowing, and I've had people that, I, that when I talk to them, they weren't saved. They weren't saved at all. I led them to the Lord. Now, they told me they went to church, and they were faithful to church somewhere. Uh, then I led them to the Lord, and uh, at the end, I said, now, you ought to read your Bible and go to church and do these things. And here's what I told them. I said, they said, well, I have a church. I said, but you, you told me a minute ago you weren't saved. They said, I wasn't. I said, how long did you go to church? And they, sometimes it was 10 or 15 or 20 years. And I said, shame on your church. Right. I said, if I went to a doctor for 20 years and he never helped me with my problem, then I went to another doctor and the very first time he healed me of my problem, guess what doctor I'm going back to? Yeah. And again, so I always tell them, uh, you know that church that didn't tell you the truth all those years? I wouldn't go back there. They're probably still not telling you the truth. Uh, but again, uh, I always tell folks, when you find the truth, you ought to hang on to it as tight as you can because there are a lot of places that do not teach the truth. A lot of folks we need to pray for. Let me mention several of them. And again, if you're on the prayer chain...
today, this evening, for our evening service, we will be having Lone Star Baptist College come through. They'll be singing for us. David, uh, one of the, David Castillo, one of the young men that's singing with him, uh, his dad now passes over the faith, but he was here for, for many, many years and their family. He'll be in the group, uh, Brother Butler. Uh, and again, Brother Butler that's, that's preaching for us tonight is not the father of Brother Butler. Brother Butler was in our church for years and so were the kids, uh, but this is his, his son. Uh, he'll be speaking tonight at the 6 o'clock service. Afterwards, uh, that we've, we've been requested, if we have enough, we'll go over, go over and play some softball after church. You can either go play or you can go watch. Um, as long as you don't make fun of the, pre, of the, of the picture, you're okay. Uh, but then we'll be doing that tonight after church. Tomorrow, July the 4th, we'll have a picnic here on the church property. Bring enough food for yourself and a little bit extra. We'll, it starts at 12 o'clock. Uh, now, if you happen to have a grill and you would plan on bringing a grill and grilling out, see me after church so I can announce that because we've had some folks that in the past we usually had it out at the Perry's house and Roy and Nathan and some of the other folks would grill, but I don't know of anyone right now that's grilling tomorrow. So if you are planning on bringing your grill, I don't have, my grill is not working at the time, so I can't bring my grill, but if you have one and, and we're planning on cooking, uh, then let us know. That way we have some folks that would like to bring some stuff to put on the grill, but they uh, do not have, they're not cooking themselves. So that's tomorrow, starts at noon. Don't know what time it ends, probably when everybody gets tired and goes home. So uh, for those older folks, that will be a little earlier. For those you, and the younger folks, that will be a little later. And then the fifth, now there's a change. That apparently we were given the wrong address for the for the funeral that's on, on Tuesday. Uh, and also they had to change the times because they have to, if you know anything about Fort Sam Houston, you have to be, you get a, a window to be at the graveside, have your service and gone. And so I'll post it out back. Charlie, do you know, did you guys get the new address? So that's one up there? Okay, so that's the new address. Uh, it's still over there really close to where we were talking about before. Uh, but uh, again, uh, that will be on July the 5th. Now we're gonna start the service. We was gonna start the viewing at 10 to 12 and then the service at 12, but because they have to be at the graveside uh, earlier than they, than they expected, we'll start the service at 10 uh, when the service is over. Whatever time it gets over, 11, 11, 15, or, or whatever time, then uh, we will wait till the, it's time to go to the, to, to the graveside for the graveside service. So we may have some, some time just to sit around after the service, but uh, because they wanted to make sure they had enough time for the service, they're going to start the service at 10. So again, if you were planning on being there at 12, you show up at 12, we'll probably be, we'll be done with the service and we'll be, it'll be just the viewing time. So that is the stuff that's up there. Also, ladies, in regards to that, if you can help uh, bring a meal, we only supply a meal for the folks when they have a, a family member that died. They come back here after the service. Uh, not all of our, our church members, but the, the family members come back and we have a, a dinner for them. So if you can help with that, Betty Perry uh, has the sign-up sheet. Uh, if you can bring something for that day, and she'll tell you what time to get it here and all that. Uh, but if you can help with that, we'd appreciate it. Don't forget the other normal stuff. So Monday and Tuesday we have that. Wednesday is our, our regular service at 7.30. Thursday, so in at 6.45. Saturday, bus visitation at 9.30, so in at 10.45. And then back in your places next week for Sunday school at 10.50. Good to have you today. All right, if you can, let's stand. We're going to sing the Star Spangled Banner. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars in the perilous fight for the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare, the bomb bursting in air, came proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Oh, thus be it ever when free men shall stand between their loved homes and the war's desolation. Blessed with victory and peace, 
May the heaven rescued land praise the power that have made and preserved us a nation. Then conquer we must when our cause it is just and this be our motto in God is our trust and the star-spangled banner in triumph shall wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Play ball. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Most people think that's actually part of the song, but it's yeah. not. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're just thankful once again for this opportunity to be here. Thank you for the blessings. Thank you for the blessing of being able to live in a free country. Thank you for the opportunity we have to give this morning. And just pray that the offering might help meet the need of our church. In Jesus' name, amen. My wife loves those kind of songs in the minor key, what she calls them. Yeah, she loves those type of songs. All right. Anyway, when I survey the wondrous cross. When I survey the wondrous cross. On which the Prince of Glory died, my rich as gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did such love and sorrow meet for oh, thorns compose so rich a crown were the whole realm of nature mine that were oppressed too small love so amazing so divine demands my soul my life 
my This is a Squire Parsons song, if you know who he is. He's been sick for a number of years, but he's written some really, really tremendous songs. This is one of them. That flag back there, you don't see it there. But I topped that, and in the midst of it is the cross, because our country was founded upon the Bible. Yeah. You do your research and do your study, and you'll figure out that the, as long as you read old history books. Um, we were founded on the Bible. We were founded on the cross. We were founded on Christianity. We need to bring back the cross. Yeah. As I watched old glory waving in the courthouse square she seemed so alone and fragile, even in despair. The stars had lost their glimmer, the stripes their majesty, as I thought, what is the matter, it seemed. Oh, glory spoke to me. Bring back the cross. By myself I cannot stand. Bring back the cross. We need the help of God's strong hand. Can't you hear, oh, glory cry? Can't you feel the grief and pain? America, bring back the cross again. It seems the glory of old glory was the smile from God above. For certain we have our faults, that's not what I'm speaking of. Oh, but the cross and flag together, they sure made quite a pair. Though the cross was invisible, all still knew that he By myself I cannot stand Bring back the cross We need the help of God's strong hand Can't you hear, oh, glory cry? Can't you feel the grief and pain? America Grab your Bibles and turn with me, if you would, to Mark chapter 9. I'm not one that usually reads long text, but I'm going to this morning because I'm going to use the whole story as part of the message this morning. Mark chapter 9. Again, I was lucky in my public school. My teachers, most of my teachers prayed before we started class. We only said the Pledge of Allegiance every day. If you young folks, all of you young folks are in school, what you should do, since you have Google on your phone, 
you ought to look up. Now, again, the world's very big about talking about all the privileged men and women who have made a lot of money in, in America. Look up the founding fathers and see what freedom cost them. Now, some of them had a lot of stuff. Most of them lost all of it or gave it all up so you and I could have the freedom we have today. Uh, and many of them lost their families. And I'm not talking about just brother and sister or mom. I'm talking about they, their families were wiped out. Uh, but again, that's not something they're going to teach you because that's not the narrative they want you to know. They don't. And again, we have folks here now. My kids have done a family an ancestry study. I have not. But I do know that my relatives showed up in Galveston from my dad's side in, from Germany many, many years ago. Came to Galveston. Uh, and again, um, came again. if you know other countries, most other countries do not have the problem we have. Most folks that come to our country know what they want to do. They want to stay. Um, you, you and I visit other countries, and if you, there's some countries, especially some countries, if you visit, you'd be glad when you leave. If you've ever been down to Mexico, and I'm talking about Mexico City, or you've been to Russia or the Ukraine or someplace like that, they don't have the things we have. I stood in Ukraine years ago at a tent meeting in 1994, and I could stand out in the middle of the street. I could look that way as far as I could look, and I could see for a long ways, probably a mile or two, zero cars. I could look that way as far as I could look, and I'd see a military, there was a military base, and they had some vehicle, vehicles in there. The whole week I was there, not one of them, I don't think any of them ever left the place, but that was only vehicles. So how'd they get around? They walked or they rode bicycles. And there wasn't very many bicycles in a, re in a regular day. Uh, I, I would see just a few bicycles, but that's how they got around because the country was a very poor country. Now, again, uh, most of us, I mean, if we had bicycles, we have one for every one of our kids. I mean, and, and by the way, there are bicycles today that cost almost as much as a car. Uh, I, I'm amazed at that. Now, I can tell you some of them are worth it. I, I, haven't, I don't own an expensive bicycle, but I rode one one time, and it was so much nicer than the cheap one that I had. Uh, better on my posterior and much easier to ride uh, than the one that I had. So, again, there, sometimes quality makes a difference. But, again, uh, we live in a very blessed place to be able to be in America. So don't ever take that for granted. It, has, it costs somebody. And, again, that's also why... Our men and women have to continue to fight because freedom, it wasn't free in the first place, and it still costs people today. Right. We have men and women. Uh, I always appreciate not just the military man or woman, but I appreciate their family because they go through a lot as well, uh, whether it's a deployment or whether it's, just, whether it's training or something else. Uh, there are a lot of nights and days that husbands and wives don't get to see their mate. Uh, now, you and I get to go home every night usually to our husband or wife, uh, but they, do, they, did not get, they don't get to do that. So again, they, and they're willing to do that. They volunteer. We haven't, we haven't made anybody go in the military in a long time. Uh, they volunteer to do that because they love our country. So again, you ought to always appreciate that. Notice Mark chapter 9 in your Bibles. Mark chapter 9, we'll start in verse 17. We're going to read down through verse 27. Mark chapter 9, notice verse 17. Now I'll just mention before I start, Brother Price likes to say that this was my mother's favorite verse when she talked about me. So... He thought this was cute years ago. He said, I know your mom's, your mom's favorite verse when she's talking to you. And here's what it says. And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. So once you get past that, that's what Brother Price thought was so funny. And he, I mean, and, and again, um, sometimes I do act dumb. All of us do. But, but he said that was my mom's favorite verse when it came to talking about me. But let's go on. And whosoever or wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth, and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out. And notice what happened. They could not. He answered him, and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be, in, be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. They brought him unto him, and when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. And he asked his father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, of a child. Now, lots of times when you find someone demon-possessed, they, they become demon-possessed during their life. Apparently, this young man had it from, from I mean, early on. Um, that's, not, that's not the norm, but that's what happened in this case. And oft times he hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. Trying to destroy his body is what he was talking about. But if thou canst do anything, now notice the phrase, if you can do anything. He, he just wanted a little bit of help. Kind of like the, the man that was in hell. What did he ask for? A drop of water to cool my tongue. He said, if you can just do anything, uh, anything, have a compassion on us and help us. And Jesus saith unto him, if thou canst believe all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, 
Help thou mine unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him. He was as one as one dead, insomuch that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him up by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. I want to speak on this thought today. Sin and the devil are hard on us. Now, I can tell you today, uh, when you, if you deal with anyone out in the public, or by the way, even if you're, if you're as old as I am, you realize that sin and the devil is hard on this body, hard on this mind, hard on us. The devil, now if you notice here, the devil did some terrible things. This demon did some terrible things to this child. This child was not benefited by being, being demon-possessed. He was harmed, and harmed repeatedly. And it wasn't just bothering the child. Guess, guess who was going? It wasn't the child that asked Jesus to, to take the spirit out. It was the father. You know why? Because it was, it was really, really tough on the family as well. I can tell you sin won't just affect you. The devil won't just affect you. He will affect your family as well. Uh, he's not happy running your life. He wants to ruin the lives of every, everyone around you. Again, you can look at the devil as a, 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 a mean child in the sense that, he, again, uh, he's unhappy, so he wants everyone else to be unhappy as well. Now, that's not going to improve for the devil. Uh, he's unhappy now. Uh, he wanted to rule and reign, failed in that. I mean, he got kicked out of heaven, thought he was going to take over for God, failed in that. And by the way, uh, the, the days that he lives now in misery, now the only joy he gets is seeing other people miserable too. That's why we have a saying. We say what? Misery loves what? The devil, like, because he's miserable, he would love to make all of us miserable too. And sometimes he does that through sin. Now, he also understands that one of these days his final, his final standing before God is going to happen. He's not going to uh, get to do what he does now, which is roam about the earth. He's going to be cast into hell to spend eternity there. And he'll be there with anyone else who's rejected Christ, anyone else who has denied Christ as far as it comes to salvation. He'll be there with them. Now, that's a place that none of you, there might be times that that sin and the devil affects us, but the thing you don't want to do is die without Christ. No one in this room uh, should, if you have any, any common sense, if you have any reason and ability, none of you, no one in this room should die without Jesus. Because if you do, and we'll show you through the Bible in a moment, if you do, you'll spend an eternity in hell. Now, if you think, I have people that sometimes tell me, I think hell is on this earth. Now, as terrible as it might be now for some people, and some people face some terrible stuff. If you've been here on Sunday nights, you realize that's nothing compared to what's going to happen after the rapture. And by the way, and the tribulation is nothing compared to what's going to happen after the end of the tribulation for all those who are lost. So it's going to, if it's bad now, it's only going to get worse. Then after that, it's going to get worse than that. And by the way, they will spend an eternity there. At least now, they, life in their mind ends it. If you're in the tribulation, at least it only happens, it only lasts seven years. But the truth is, if you, if you die without Jesus Christ, you will spend an eternity in misery and suffering and pain. All the things that you and I fear, all the things that you and I hate, the darkness, the demons, the falling, I mean, all those things, the, the fire, all those things that scare us. And if you're smart, you'd be scared of all those things on this earth. You especially would be scared of, those, of facing those things for an eternity. So today, when we, we want to speak for a few moments on this thought. Sin and the devil are hard on us. Let's pray, and then we'll get into the message. Lord, I ask you for your help. I ask you, Lord, that you would speak through me, that you'd help me to say what I need to say and not say anything that I shouldn't. I pray, Lord, that especially if there's one here today without Christ, that they'd realize they don't need to leave. They might have came without Christ. They don't need to leave without Christ. And I pray, Lord, you'd help all of us that are saved, that we'd realize that though the devil can no longer possess us, as he did this young man, the devil can still influence us. And, Lord, that is entirely up to us. But we decide how much we let the devil uh, be involved in our lives, how much room we give him, how, how much we, we give in to him, and how much we, we allow him to to mess with us and our families. I pray, Lord, you'd help us be wise, that, Lord, we might learn something from the message today, and you might get glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, notice in the story, it's, it mentioned that this young man was demon-possessed, and he, he was having a terrible life. Now, again, this child did not get to do what normal children got to do. He didn't get to play marbles out in the street. He didn't get to play kickball. He didn't get to go to school. He didn't get to go camping with his mom and dad. He, had, he didn't get to go fishing. You know why? Because the demon that was inside of him controlled him and destroyed his life. And because as a, as a parent, you and I are affected by our children, it wasn't just messing up this child's life. And he had a terrible life. He, I mean, some terrible things have been happening to him. Um, now, 
If we have a seizure, that's a terrible time. This kid didn't just have a seizure. He had seizures all the time. I mean, think about it. Now, again, we mentioned the young man that got burnt by, uh, by, the, by the grill. Fire is not something you and I enjoy messing with, but the demon, the, the, the demon would throw this boy's body in and out of the fire. When they had open fire, as the child would be around the fire, the demon would, cat, would, would knock him into the fire, throw, this, throw his body into the fire. Who knows how many burns this child had on his body and how, how tore up his physical body was, all because of the devil and his influence on him. Now, this child was not the one that asked for help. Maybe he was not even capable of asking for help. Because if you notice, it says he had a dumb spirit. You know what that means? You can't talk. You can't hear. You can't talk. He was usually, we call it deaf and dumb. We don't mean that in the wrong way. What we simply mean is that was a term for saying, I can't hear and I can't speak. So the child could not ask him for, for help himself, so dad did. Now I can tell you the child was excited and glad when he got the help. I can tell you that, that and again, you never really appreciate something until you've lost it. Yeah. But the fact that this child had never, now, can you imagine the first day this child got to go fishing? The first day this child got to sit and enjoy a campfire? The first day this child got to, I mean, was able to hug mom and dad or spend some time with his brothers or sisters? I mean, he, was, he did not have a normal childhood. Now, I don't know what a normal childhood is anymore because the world has changed so greatly. Uh, there's a lot. Of, now, for those of you that are raised by moms and dads who love you, I can tell you that isn't always a normal childhood. I thought every child had the same life that I had. I thought all parents were like my parents until as I grew older, I realized how lucky I was. You say, did they ever discipline you? Often. You know why? Because I needed it. The Bible says the foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. I mean, we, we, we start out stupid, okay? I mean, we have, to, we have to have someone help us fix that. Now, sometimes it amazes me. We have adults that sometimes act like children, yeah. throw their temper tantrums. They don't get their way. They kick their feet and fuss and holler or riot or do other stupid stuff. You know what that means? I don't get my way, so I'm, I'm going to make everyone else. I'm unhappy, so I'm going to make everybody else unhappy too. There are a lot of folks that live that way. Thank goodness you and I don't have to. But we want to look today at sin and the devil is hard on us. Notice the first thing. You go to your Bible to Proverbs chapter 23. I want to tell you this first thought is the fact that sin and the devil destroys your health and your family. He does that through addictions. Notice Proverbs chapter 23, verse 35. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When, I, when shall I awake? What does he say what he'll do? I will seek it yet again. He's talking here of an alcoholic, and this alcoholic, he drinks, and you know what? They beat him. He doesn't feel it. Oh, he'll feel it tomorrow morning. When he wakes up and he thinks, man, what happened to me? He's all skinned up. He's all bruised up. Probably doesn't have any money left in his pockets. Either he spent it on booze or his friends that was hanging out with him, I mean, stole it from him. But again, you know what happens? He'll sober up and then he'll go do it again. I tell people all the time, drinking is one of the stupidest things you could do. Not only is it expensive. Now, I I've, I've often say, I hate to throw up. I don't ever volunteer to throw up. I hate to puke. So guess what? If I can, I don't do stuff that makes me puke. I don't. I don't volunteer. Now, I also like to know what's going on. I said this to someone here a while back, someone who drank, and I said, my children never had, if my children woke up in the middle of the night and had, a, had some kind of terrible accident or had some kind of illness, dad could always drive them to the hospital without putting them in more danger. But you know what? There are moms and dads that go to bed drunk. If their child has a problem, they don't even know it because you can't wake them up. And they couldn't drive if you could wake them up. Because if they did, they'd end up probably getting in a terrible accident and whatever was wrong with the child now is, is complicated worse because of the alcohol. Again, if you look up and study alcoholism, you'll see it messes with your brain function. It slows your immune system. It, inhi it inhibits new bone production. It causes in infertility. It causes heart issues. It causes gum issues, esophagus ulcers. It causes acid reflux. It causes internal bleeding, stomach ulcers. changes your behavior. slows your speech and coordination. Now, for those of you that are not very coordinated, you don't need to drink because you're already bad enough, all right? You, you already stumble and fall enough. Alcohol, you do not need the influence of alcohol. It causes pancreatic trouble and the liver damage. Now, listen to me. There's nothing, you say, Brother Block, is there any very good, any good traits about alcohol? It will help you forget your problems for a, for a short time. Here's the problem. When you sober up, guess what? The problem's still there, and you, and you have less money in your pocket. And maybe you did some terrible things that you don't even remember while you were drunk. Now, 
I know people that when they get drunk, they don't remember anything they did the next morning. Nothing. Nothing. Now, in my old age, there's times I can't remember anything the next morning either, but at least it's not because of alcohol. All right? It destroys your health. Usually your family as well, but the devil's hard on us. He's hard on us with cigarettes. Now, again, I've seen some terrible, I've seen some folks that was really, really, I had a yard customer that had been smoking since he was 13 or 14 years old. Went into the merchant marines when he was like 16 or 17 because he couldn't get into the regular marine because he wasn't old enough. He lied about his age. Went and fought for our country. I was, I've mowed his yard for several years. He was an older man. Lived over here uh, in the latitude harness area over here. Uh, and at the end, he was having to drag around a little oxygen bottle because he couldn't breathe without the oxygen bottle. You say, well, that's, that's, that's tough. Oh, I've seen it tougher than that. I visited someone in the hospital one time that was dying of cancer, and they were so addicted to the cigarettes that uh, they, they, they had the stuff on their mouths, and they had a little hole in the throat that they were breathing through. They would have the family members hold the cigarette up to the little hole in the throat, and they would smoke through the hole in their throat. Now, that's addicted. By the way, that's also very expensive. Now, I can remember as a kid, cigarettes were 35 cents a pack. Now I think they're like 35 bucks a pack. I mean, they're a lot more expensive now, and I'm exaggerating a little bit, but not, not much. Drug abuse, seizures, strokes, mental confusion. I already mentioned I have enough mental confusion now. I don't need to help it, all right? When you get older, you're going to already, I mean, there's some days you wake up and you think, where am I? Who am I? And what am I? I mean, you're trying to figure out what's going on. But again, drug abuse, brain damage, depression, anxiety, panic disorders, increased aggression, hallucinations, heart attacks, kidney damage, liver damage, overdose. I mean, all those things. By the way, we could talk about addictions for an hour. You know what we conclude at the end? They are bad for you and your body. They're bad for me and my body. They destroy us. And by the way, they don't just affect you and I. They affect relatives and loved ones as well. Again, I said the devil and sin are hard on us. The second thing I want you to see, go in your Bible to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. If you allow the devil, he'll have you living in chains. Mark chapter 5, notice verse 4. Mark chapter 5, verse 4. Because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. Now listen to me. This man was put into chains by people trying to control his being demon possessed but I can tell you that the devil will put you in chains as well today you know why a lot of people are in prison because of sin because of sin now I'm sure there are some innocent people in prison but most folks in prison they, it, they're not in there because they just did a little something a little bit wrong the truth is some people have to do it they have, they have it where there's three strikes and you're out. Some of them, I mean, they got out the first two or three times. They got off the first two or three times and didn't even have any consequences. They didn't even get in trouble until the third or fourth time. Now, again, it'll have you in chains. It had this man, this man, because of his demon possession, he was in chains. Now, notice what it said about him. He plucked him asunder, and again, he broke the fetters in pieces. Now, because he was demon possessed, he had the ability to do that. But again, think about what that did to his flesh. He was, the demon was still in a fleshly body. It was still doing terrible damage to his physical body. If you're a child of God, the devil, you cannot be demon-possessed, but you can be demon-influenced. What that means is you can still allow the devil to have some part in your life. Now, you should not, that's one of the reasons I don't, now, I'm not a big scary movie fan anyway, but I stay away from all the stuff that has to do with demon-possession. It's not something, you say, what, why? It scares me. The devil is a very powerful being. Now, again, I don't consider myself a big, strong guy, but a fellow that was one of my heroes, Jim Vineyard, the Green Beret that can kill, kill a guy 98 ways with these two hands. I mean, that fella, you know what he said? He said he hated preaching on the devil. You know, then he stood up in church and he said, because I'm afraid, I'm scared of the devil. Now listen to me. If Brother Vineyard, who can kill someone 98 ways with these two hands, is scared of the devil, trust me, I'm scared of him too. When we sing the kids' song about the devil, you know what the Bible talks about? We can do certain things, and the, and the phrase at the end of that song says, through the power of the Lord. Now, you and I cannot defeat the devil by ourselves. If you ever try, you will fail. You are not capable. I am not capable of defeating the devil. If you have victory of something in your life, trust me, it, didn't, it wasn't just you. You had some help because the devil is powerful. 
If you're lost, he'll keep you in those bonds until he can, by the way, take you there, and then he can, he can put you in bondage for eternity, and he'd love to do that. If you're a child of God, he'd like to take away your freedom. And by the way, when you get saved, you become free indeed. But if you're not careful, you can put yourself back into bondage. Yes. Now listen to me. You know what the prison people will tell you? That most of those folks, when they leave, guess what they say? See you soon. You know why? Because a lot of folks that get out of prison, they go back to prison again and again and again and again. Some of them have spent more time in prison than they have out in real life. Now, thankfully, many of us have not. Now, I've went and visited prisons, and I've went and, and done, had services, I mean, done stuff to prisons, but I've never been behind a cell overnight. I can't think of, there's a lot of scary thoughts, but one of the scariest ones to me would be when they finally close that door. You're in a room with a bunch of total strangers, and, that, and you hear that door lock, and they walk away, and you realize, I am in here with some terrible, terrible people. By the way, they're not your friend. They don't care about you. Many of them already are going to face some terrible stuff. So you know what? They don't care if they get any more stuff, any more time tacked on because they've already, they're already facing a lot of time anyway. Many of them are never going to get to see the light of day outside of a prison for the rest of their life. So you're not important to them. Scary. But the devil, if you allow him, if you allow sin, it will, it will have you living in chains. The third thing, notice Ephesians chapter 2. The third thing I want you to see today is, again, the devil and, and sin. When I said it destroys your life, Ephesians chapter 2, notice verse 1. The third thing is this, it'll have you and I living spiritually dead. Now, when I'm talking about that, that'll be the lost folks. And for Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 says, but, And you hath he quickened, now that means made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Before I was, now listen to me, at nine years of age, I was alive physically. But that day something happened to me. I got born again. Now, so that means at age nine, I was dead spiritually. Dead men walking. I mean, I was dead. There might be someone here today. You're dead. You don't even realize. You say, but look, I'm alive. If you're not saved, you're dead. You're dead in your trespasses and sins. And if you don't change that, now you can do something about that. It's not, and by the way, you don't have to have your parents' permission. You don't have to have your wife or your husband's permission. It, it, it doesn't matter what the boss thinks at work. You can take care of this all on your own. And by the way, nobody else can do it for you. I said, he'll have you living spiritually dead. You're lost. He wants you to stay lost. Right. He'll send you to the graveyard. We read that verse, Mark chapter 5. Notice verse 3 again. Who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no not with chains. He'll have you living in the graveyard. Now, what I mean by that is, he'll have you hanging out with other dead people. Yep. Now, I often joke, my granddaughters, are not, they have never caught on to this. We'll drive by a great big graveyard, all those all those signs out there, and I'll say, man, how many dead people, how many dead people you think are out there? And my granddaughters will start looking, and I'll say, all of them. Yeah. Have the answer, say, what size is the graveyard? It doesn't matter. All the folks out there are dead, okay? Now, unless someone's visiting, but usually the graveyard is empty. All of them. Now, listen to me. The devil would like for you to live dead on this earth. Then he wants you to spend eternity dead in your trespasses and sins and continue to pay for that. Notice Luke chapter 16, verse, 30, or verse 23, Luke chapter 16, verse 23. He wants you to live spiritually dead. He wants you sent to the graveyard to die physically and sent to the graveyard. And if you think the graveyard is the end of it, it is not. Notice what he says in Luke chapter 16, verse 23. Now, this guy died. The Bible says the rich man died. And notice what it said in the next verse, and in hell. Now, that's not talking about the grave. It's talking about a real place, a place with fire, a place with darkness, a place with falling, a place with demons. And in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torment. Now, for those that think they're going to go to hell and have a party, they're mistaken. There's going to be no party. There's going to be no booze sitting around with their buddies and joking and, and laughing and having a good time. You say, why? How come they're not going to be laughing and having a good time? They're too busy screaming. They're too busy howling in pain. They're too busy gnashing, grinding their teeth because they hurt so much. Notice it went on and said, And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeing Abraham afar off, and lies within his bosom. Now listen to me. Not everybody goes to hell. While the rich man had a lot of money and thought he was living it up, the fellow that lived right outside of his house, a poor guy living on the streets, had more sense than him. You know why? Because he prepared correctly for his eternity. He realized money was not the answer. 
being rich was not the answer. Now, I can tell you, it's nice to be able to, to buy something that's not on the dollar menu at one of the fast food joints. It tastes a little better sometimes. Now, I'm not one that likes all the extra guacamole and sour cream and all that stuff anyway. So I just like the regular taco. I like the regular bean and cheese burrito. I'm a pretty simple guy. But the truth is, there are some things that, I mean, sometimes it's nice. It's nice to have air conditioning in your house. How many of you grew up without air conditioning like me? We didn't have air conditioning. We had an attic fan. So at nighttime, we'd open up all the windows, turn on the attic fan, and sometimes it was so hot in our room, we'd lay out in the hallway where the attic fan was because at least there was some air moving. Hot. Now, you said, Bill Block, I thought you said uh, Missouri is, is going to be the new Jerusalem someday. They won't need air conditioning in Missouri, but right now it's hot. Now again, in hell he lift up his eyes, but he, he saw Lazarus, and Lazarus was, a, was in Abraham's bosom. When we think of that, that's a place of comfort. That's a place of peace. That's a place, I mean, again, he was in a good place. The rich man, now the rich man did not go to hell because he was rich. Lazarus didn't go to hell because he was poor. Some people think all poor people go to heaven. That's not true. All saved people go to heaven. All saved poor people, all saved rich people go to heaven. By the way, all lost poor people and all lost rich people go to hell. And it is their choice. If you die and go to hell uh, in, in the future, it'll be your choice because you told Jesus no. Because he stood at your door and he knocked and you didn't say come in. Instead, you ignored him. You're not going to go to hell because you're a bad person. Everyone in this room's a bad person. Everyone in this room's a sinner. If you go to hell, it'll be because you didn't do anything about your sin problem. You didn't allow Jesus to forgive you and save you and make you a new person in Christ. He was living spiritually dead, then went to, went to the grave, then ultimately to hell. Again, that's what sin of the devil will do to you. Number four, he'll have you take your life through guilt and misery. Notice Matthew chapter 27 in your Bible. Matthew chapter 27. Well-known verse about a well-known man. And he cast down, chapter Matthew 27, verse 5, and he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple, and he departed and went out and hanged himself. You say, why did he do that? Because he was miserable. He felt terrible about what he had done. The sad thing was, if Judas would have been smart, he'd have got saved first. But he didn't. And, he, and today, he, back then, to over 2,000 years ago, he, he, he went to hell. 2,000 years later, he's still in hell, still suffering. But again... There are people out there that, are, that live a miserable life. They feel like there's nothing to live for. Now, I can tell you, if you're a child of God, even on your worst day, and you can have some bad days as a child of God, you're never alone because the Bible says he'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. You're never alone as a child of God. But there are the, the world, there are a lot of them that are alone. They have nobody that cares about them, no one that, 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 that worries about them, no one that loves them. So they get miserable. Years ago on Teenage Soul Winning, I've told you this before, Brother Perry's son Andrew was out knocking doors on, on Saturday at Teenage Soul Winning over in, in Heritage Park. Knocked on the door, knocked once, no one answered, knocked a second time. Man came to the door, Andrew talked to him, led the man to the Lord, and the man told him the story. He said, I was sitting in the room, I had a gun in my hand and I put it in my mouth. And I told God, I don't see, any, I don't see anything that life is worth living for. I just want to end it all. If you really care about me, then show me. He said, he heard a knock on his door. He said, with that gun in my mouth, he said, I thought, is that you, Lord? He said, I heard the knock a second time. He said, I put the gun down. He told Andrew, I put the gun down. I came to the door, and you were here at the door. And by the way, listen to me. He went from death, really going to be death, physical death and spiritual death, to life. By the way, if you're wondering whether your soul winning is important, it might be that you're the last person to talk to a lost person before they stand, before they're ultimately going to face God. And that we will, at least, we will give them an opportunity to accept Christ. Now, not everyone you talk to is going to get saved. Not everybody you, you give a tract to is going to accept it. But there are some that will. And there's some that need it. I mean, they need it now. They need it today. Not next week, not next month, but today. Again. The devil and sin will get you to take your life through guilt or misery. You feel like you have nothing to live for. Now listen, if you're a child of God, quit letting the devil sit on your shoulder and tell you uh, how miserable you need to be. He is lying to you. You have life. You have abundant life. 
You have a God that cares about you. By the way, if you come to church, you have brothers and sisters in Christ that care about you. You'll, you'll find friends, by the way, that really will be true friends. They're not just your friends because you've got money to, to buy stuff for them. They'll care about you when you can't do nothing for them because they're a true friend. Sin and the devil, number five, will have you living with the pigs and like a pig. Notice Matthew chapter 8 in your Bibles. Matthew chapter 8. So the devil, is verse 31, so the devil besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, suffer us to go into that herd of swine. Again, sin and the devil have you living with the pigs and living like a pig. Notice Luke chapter 8 in your Bibles. Luke chapter 8. You're in Matthew, two books over Luke chapter 8. Notice verse 33. Luke chapter 8, verse 33 says, Then went the devils out of the man and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the lake and were choked. Luke chapter 15, verse 16. A couple chapters over. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. This was, a, this was the prodigal son. But he had got to a point that, you know what? He was living with the pigs. He was eating with the pigs. And if you listen to me, you let sin and the devil have its way, you'll be living a pig's life. You'll be living a hog's life. Now listen to me. My dad was a hog farmer. I know a lot about pigs. And they often make a statement, there's nothing, I mean, you're not happy like a pig in mud. Now, a pig loves its mud. It does. You know why we raise pigs? Mmm, that's why we raise pigs. We raise pigs to eat them. Because pigs make bacon and sausage and ham and pork chops. Man, that's what, a, listen, a pig's life, I mean, now, you say, Brother Block, I can't believe you do that to pigs. I do that to pigs. I do that to cows not big on sheep and goats. If you have some, cook it up. I'll try it. Brother Peugeot eats rattlesnake. I know some folks that ate a raccoon a while back, made raccoon, made, made the raccoon uh, tacos. I mean, you say, Brother Block, you like all meats? I like meat, not all meats. I mean, but I do like meat. You say, Brother Block, I don't think you should eat meat. You know what? If you read your Bible very well, you'll find that God told the folks to eat meat. Now, the Jews were not allow, allowed to eat certain meats because it's a little harder on your stomach and it was a, for health reasons. But the truth is, the Bible... Now, and if you're wondering if animals feel something, yes, they do. But let, listen to me, so do plants. If you're, if you're one of these folks, you, you're, you're a vegetarian because you don't, you don't want to hurt animals. Uh, there are scientists that, that have done studies that when you cut your grass or you pluck that grass, they, that, that plant actually puts out a noise. That plant is screaming. You hurt it. It didn't bleed. Now, by the way, some plants even bleed. I mean, you break, I mean, so if you're, if you're worried about hurting stuff, you probably just ought to starve to death and go to heaven. I mean, because there's nothing you can really eat that you're not going to hurt. It'll, you're caught. Now, I'm very humane. I, I, if, if I know someone's making something suffer, I'm going to put it into them. Uh, not the, again, I'm not, I'm not big on anything suffering, and you shouldn't let anything suffer. And by the way, uh, but, but again, you know why God made all that? And we're not, a lot, we're not a, another form of animal. We're not a higher form of animal. We're man. And God gave us the trees, and God gave us the animals, and God gave us those things so that we can live. By the way, we're supposed to take care of them. Your best environmentalists are not usually the environmentalists. Your best environmentalists are usually the farmers and the hunters and the other folks who, by the way, realize that sometimes it's better to take some animals than let them starve to death. If you've ever seen an animal starve to death, you realize that is a terrible way for an animal to die. Terrible. God gave, you say, why did God give them to us? To enjoy. By the way, some of them are companionship. As I've said, I've got a horse that my wife loves. It's 29 years old and it just won't die. It just keeps living. People will come up and they say, your horse is still alive? Yep, sad to say, there he is. He just won't die. He said, I didn't know horses lived that long. I wish horses didn't live that long either. Say, why do you not like your horse? Because during deer season, he eats my deer corn. Cows can't get corn off the ground, but the, deer, the, the horse can't. My roses, if the fence is here, my roses are this tall here, and over here they're this tall. You know why? Because it reaches his long, stinking neck across the fence and eats my roses. You say the thorns and everything? Everything. If he could get to my garden, he would eat my garden. The horse is a nuisance. I'm not sure who invented I guess it was God, but I mean, whoever invented that we spend time with horses was a knucklehead. He said, Brother Block, you hate all horses? I don't hate my horse. If I hated it, I'd, I'd have let it die a long time ago. I love it. I just don't always like everything it does. Kind of like kids, some people. But no, I'm just joking. But again, understand, you, you, you let sin and the devil have his way, you're going you're gonna to live a pig's life, a pig's lifestyle. Look at lost people. 
Look at how some of them live. Years ago, I was driving to church on a Sunday night, and I saw a guy laying along the road, right there along the road as it came off the highway there. He was laying in the grass. I thought he was dead. I pulled over. I, I got there. He was passed out drunk. Or from other, found out later it was from other stuff. I called the, called the ambulance. The ambulance came. The guy, I mean, tried to get him to wake up. Uh, found out he was on meth. Took us to the little hotel right there where he lived. We opened up the door, and the smell was so strong. You say, what was it? Oh, they didn't have dogs, and they didn't have cats, but it was a smell of feces, their feces. It was a smell of urine, their urine. Because they were so addicted to meth, they would go out and get the meth. They'd come back. And by the way, when we went to that hotel, there was a lady in there just in bad a shape as he was. Teeth all rotted out, body all immaculate. I mean, I mean, all, I mean, skinny and starving because they was living on meth. Now, if you're wondering uh, whether sin's good on your body, it is not. It's hard on your body. You know what they were living like? They were living like pigs. You know why they was doing that? Because sin had a hold of them. Sixth thing, I must hurry. Sin and the devil are hard on us. It's a re, the sin of the devil will make us a reproach. It's a reproach to our nation. Notice Proverbs chapter 14, verse 34. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 34. I know God loves America. And God's blessed America. But I can tell you, sometimes I'm sure God looks down at America and just shakes his head and says, can't believe it started there and it's got to here. With the abortions, the adultery, the riots, the drug issues, all the stuff. I mean, again, you said, Brother Block, I thought you said America is a great place. It is. I didn't say it didn't have problems. We do some terrible things. There are people that do some terrible things. And by the way, sometimes our leaders and, uh, of our cities and our towns and our government do some terrible things. They're not all godly men and women. Some of them worship the other guy or they work for the other team. Sins of reproach. Notice what it said there. In Proverbs chapter 14, verse 34, righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Listen to me. You know what God loves? He loves what's going on at Liberty Baptist Church today. He loves men and women coming to, coming to church to worship Him, to talk to Him, to spend some time with Him, to honor Him. He likes it when you go home. And by the way, He likes it when we do that more than just on Sunday. We're not just supposed to live a Christian life on Sunday. We're supposed to live the Christian life seven days a week. You say, Brother Block, that's hard. I know it is because we still live in this fleshly body. But we're still supposed to try as hard as we can. We're supposed to try to, you say, well, uh, I'm not as bad as some people. Well, no, but you're not as good as Jesus. And he's the one we're supposed to compare ourselves with, not other people. If you compare yourself to some other person, you might feel pretty good about yourself. You're not supposed to compare yourself to other people. You're supposed to look to him. And when you look to him, he's perfect. And guess what? We're not. We still have a lot of work to do. Sends a reproach to our nation. Number seven, makes you lose your power. Notice Judges chapter 16. One of the most powerful men in the world. You know what sin cost him? It cost him his power. Notice Judges chapter 16 verse 19. She made him sleep upon her knees and she called for, the man, for a man and he caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head. She began to afflict him and his strength went from him. Now before... He can always rise up and tear people apart. I mean, destroyed cities. I mean, wiped out armies by himself. Problem was, he played around with sin. You know what happened? He lost that power. He no longer. You know what he became? He became just like every other individual. And the reason for it was because of sin. It takes your, takes your strength. Notice Psalm chapter 137. It will take your joy. Psalm chapter 137 Notice verses 1 through 4. Psalm 137, verses 1 through 4. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, and yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. They were remembering the back home. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song. They wanted the Israelites to sing to them. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. Here's what they said. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? What they said is, I don't feel like singing. Listen to me, you, you and I as Christians play around with sin. It will take your, your joy. It will take your song. You say, can a Christian be miserable? Yes, a Christian can. We cannot be demon-possessed, demon but we can be demon. We can let the devil, we can, we can play around with the devil, and many Christians do. And you'll lose your power with God. You'll lose your joy. 
By the way, you also lose something else. It will hinder your prayer life. Notice Psalm chapter 66. You're in Psalm 137. Go to Psalm chapter 66. Notice verse 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Here's what he says. I want to hear from you. I want to talk with you, but I can't because you got this, there's a sin problem. There's sin between us. He says, again, sin will hinder your prayer life. Husbands, we have to be careful. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7 says, Likewise, your husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Sin can make it where we, we can't pray correctly. Our prayers don't go through. There are a lot of Christians that pray. And now in here, the ceiling is pretty tall, but most of us live in a house with an eight-foot ceiling. Most, sometimes our prayers don't even get to the ceiling. We don't even make it eight feet. Now here, it's a lot higher than that. But the truth is, in order for you to have joy, in order for you to have prayer power, we need to make sure that we, st- we keep away from sin. You will never defeat it, but you should always be fighting it. It's kind of like a fat person trying to lose weight. We probably never become skinny again, but we got to keep working. Otherwise, guess what? We're going to get fatter. So you know what we do? We work every day to try to keep from getting any fatter. We're sinners. If you just give in to sin, it will overwhelm you. It will destroy you. Sometimes people won't even know you're a child of God. You'll live just as bad as they do. You'll say the same stuff they say. You'll live the same way they live. A lot did that. Fell at, at, at Bible college, when I was in Bible college, did that. When I witnessed to people, their statement was, doesn't that guy go to your church? Yes. That was the end of the conversation. They walked away. They did not want to talk to me about Jesus because he went to the same church I went to. And by the way, he wasn't the example that he should have been. Can the child of God turn people? Now listen to me. You're already safe, so you can't go to hell yourself. But if you and I live in such a way, we can, we can send others. We can assist others in going to hell. And by the way, the devil gets a big kick out of that. He really loves it when children of God help lost people stay lost. And the last thing, and I'll be through, not only does it take your joy and hinder your prayer life, but if you're lost today, your sin and the devil will send you to hell. Notice Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. Now, death we're talking about is described for us in Revelation chapter 21, verse 8 where it makes this statement. But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the whoremongers and sorcerers and adulterers and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, that's hell, which is the second death. So again, uh, that death that we deserve from Romans 6, 23, that death that our sin makes us, you say, Brother Block, I like to earn stuff. You don't want to earn this one. This is one time you don't want to, one thing you don't want to earn, but you say, Brother Block, uh, So if I worked really hard and I quit sinning, will that do me any good? No, because you've already sinned in the past. And even if you could quit sinning, which you can't because you live in a fleshly human body, even if you could quit sinning, you you still have that sin debt from behind you. The sin debt from the sins yesterday and the day before, last month and last year, it will send you to hell. Revelation chapter 20 verse 14 says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Then it it makes it very simple. Whosoever's name, verse 15, was not found written in the book of life, was cast into the lake of fire. Last week when Sophia got saved, she got her name written in a book. Just like we signed a book at a funeral, just like we we, we put our name in a book at a wedding. She got her name put in a book last week. A very important book. The book called the book of life. Her name was put there, and guess what? It's it's in non-erasable ink. No one can ever take it away from her. No one can ever, it doesn't, now I always say this, even if I wanted to be lost today, and I don't, even if I wanted to, I can't. There's lots of times you can end in give. I mean, you can go back on something, but you can't lose your salvation. Back to that Romans chapter 6, and I'll be done. Notice verse 23, the last part I didn't read earlier. I read you the first part, and here's what it said, for the wages of sin is death. That's the bad news, but there's some good news that follows. But the gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. I often say this, don't come down front and want to join our church and think that will get you to heaven because that's not how you get to heaven. You get to heaven through Jesus Christ our Lord. You get saved through Jesus, you get kept by Jesus, and by the way, when you go to heaven someday, all be, all be because of Jesus. Not because of Liberty Baptist Church, not because of Brother Block, not because of somebody else. Now hopefully Liberty Baptist Church or Brother Block or other, other folks here will have a help and have an influence in your life and help get you to Jesus. You know why we're taking you to Jesus? Because we can't fix your problem. 
but we can take you to someone. For instance, it's like a little brother that gets hurt. We take him into mom and dad because we can't fix it, but mom and dad can. As a child of God, that's what we're doing in soul winning. What we're trying to do is get people to Jesus. We're not trying to win them to ourselves. It doesn't do us any good to win them to ourselves. We're not trying to sell them on our church. It doesn't do us any good to sell them on our church. We're trying to, we're trying to talk them into asking Jesus to forgive them and save them. And by the way, he's more than willing to do so. I told you earlier about standing at the door knocking. He does that. He did that for me when I was nine years old. He knocked, and you know what? I, I wasn't all that bright as a nine-year-old, but I was old enough to realize I did not want to go to hell. Now, I didn't want to go to heaven. So I, you know what I said? Come in. And guess what he did? He came in. And guess what? Many, many years from age nine, 52 to be exact, guess what? I'm still saved. You know why? Because that verse said, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is a week and a half, 10 years, 50 years, 100 years. It's eternal life. I couldn't lose it if I wanted to lose it. Now, I lose a lot of stuff, trust me. But thank goodness I've never lost my salvation. And if you get saved today, you couldn't lose it either. And if you are saved today, you can't lose it either. Now, you can lose your joy, you can lose your, you can lose your song, you can lose your power, you can, lose, you can be hindered in your prayer life. I mean, you can let the devil take away some stuff from you, but he can't take your salvation because he's not the one that gave it to you in the first place. And the one who gave it to you in the first place doesn't want it back. He's got plenty more left. He said, I'm not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. If you're here today without Christ, you know what you should do? Come to repentance. Come down front in a moment when we give the invitation. Open up your heart and let Jesus come in. Don't join our church because our church can't save you. Don't turn over a new leaf in life because a new leaf in life can't save you. Meet Jesus today. Let him come into your heart. He can save you. Father, thank you for the, your goodness. Thank you, Lord, that though the devil had a lot of influence in our lives, many of us had enough sense to one day tell the devil no and tell Jesus yes. And we got saved. If there's someone here today without Jesus, I pray, Lord, today will be the day they tell Jesus yes. When they hear that knock on the door, 